and we had a block of ice, and that was our cold storage unit. And the second thing I remember, they made these veggie hot dogs, these corn dogs that were really good. And the third thing I remember was the singing at camp meeting. They belted it out. You could hear it all over that campus. And I want to encourage you to sing from your abdomen and sing this song out. We have this hope. If you'd like to stand with me, I invite you to stand. You can't really sing this song sitting down. Stand with me. I'll let you sit down on the next song. But stand with me as we sing this song, if you're able. Page 190, we have this hope. We have this hope that burns within our hearts. Hope in the coming of the Lord. We have this faith that Christ alone imparts. Faith in the promise of His word. We believe the time is here when the nations far and near shall awake and shout and sing Alleluia Christ is King We have this hope that burns in our hearts Hope in the Turn to page 175. Are these coming on the screen? Do we have words, or are you using the hymnals? Excellent. What's our next song? <laughs> 186. We have heard a joyful sound. We'll sing first, third, and fourth verses. You know what I love about these Adventist hymns, is there a sermon in of themselves? You read the words, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing it softly through the gloom when the heart for mercy craves. Sing in triumph o'er the tomb, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. We can cling to that thought of Jesus no matter what we're doing. Sing with me. We have heard a joyful sound, page 186. First, third, and fourth verse. Cross the waves. 
page 175, there's power in the blood. I was with our <clears throat> president uh, this week, and I, he was singing this song. And I said, Dave, you like that one? And I said, yeah, yeah, that's one of my favorites. I said, well, we'll sing it this Sabbath. I love this one, too. There is power in the blood. You know, when you hear blood, that means life. God gives life, new life, transformed life. Let's sing about it. All four verses, page 175, there's power in the blood. you to stand with me as we sing our opening song, Lift Up the Trumpet. <clears throat> Page 172, Lift Up the Trumpet. Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring.
Father, it's so good to be back. What a Sabbath you've given us. Uh, right from the start of last night, all through today. Great fellowship, great food, great spiritual uh, nourishment we've had. And we've come to the close of the Sabbath. We just want to tell you, stay close to us all week long. Please. We just surrender everything that we have to you, just knowing that there's just nothing in this world that's worth anything compared to our relationship with you. We love you all of our heart. Bless us tonight in each aspect of this program, please. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'll pass it off to James Mangum and the Pathfinders. Good evening once again. I think for those that are here normally on Sabbath evening, you know we do something special for our Pathfinders. And this evening we have two things that we'd like to do. We have an award that we give out, but before we do that award, we are going to have a special music this evening. And Sister Awana, who is one of the... Uh, Oh, hold on. She's not singing? Yeah. She, okay. All right. She is going to be singing a song this evening for us. She is part of the Pathfinder Club in Orion, uh, the Spanish Orion Pathfinder Club in Birmingham, Alabama. And she has come here tonight to share with us in song a, a, a message about the second coming that we're tired of being here on this earth. We long for the day to go to heaven. So for those of you that understand Spanish, you'll get the message. For those in English, that is the subject matter that she's going to be singing. And after that, we will come back up for a couple of awards that we'd like to present this evening. So at this time, please welcome Sister Juana as she shares with us about Jesus and the second coming. Good evening. God bless you. Mi 
esperanza eres Señor mi esperanza dulce consuelo a mi corazón pues algún día te veré mi alegría eres Señor mi alegría yo solo río cuando pienso en ti pues algún día te veré Thank you, Sister Juana. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Come say it was, oh, Jesus, Lord, is what the word, uh, uh, the song uh, talked about. My name is Ivan Lugo. I am uh, Associate Director for uh, Gulf States Pathfinders Council, also uh, sits Chairman of the Pathfinder Council. And uh, I just lost all my help because Pastor Mangum now decided to do something less important stuff for the conference. As executive, uh, uh, executive, all, uh, right, executive, we're, something we're, like we're, that. We need to move along, brother. Yeah, move executive along. secretary. And then uh, uh, Tanya, uh, she, she does everything. Uh, Tanya Mangum, she's the administrative secretary for uh, youth programs, and Tanya just does everything. So if Tanya is not here, I wouldn't know what to do. But I do want to put in a plug for, for Pathfinders. I, I know you have a very loaded program here this evening, but just take a moment. We have record numbers uh, in our conference. Uh, for a number of clubs, a uh, number of adventurer clubs as well, number of members in those clubs. And our goal is for every church in our conference to have an adventurer club and a Pathfinder club. Amen. And we're not there yet, but we're making tremendous progress. And uh, we are going to run out of room very, very soon over at Camp Alamisco. Every year we struggle to fit people in there, but somehow we manage to fit everybody in camp, and we want to get to the point that we just don't have any more room in Camp Alamisco for youth activities. So that's, that's our end goal. Uh, this evening, we want to present the John Hancock Award. The John Hancock Award is awarded to exceptional leadership within uh, Pathfinder clubs. And this year, we have two recipients uh, that have demonstrated uh, exceptional abilities in, in not just promoting uh, Christianity, not just promoting uh, our church doctrine and our church beliefs amongst the youth, but also have exceptional programs in their club and have superior leadership abilities and, and superior performance as far as Pathfinder leadership is concerned. So our first award this evening is for Sister Juana uh, and for uh, uh, Brother Pedro. Thank you. And our second award this evening is for Pedro, uh, Brother Pedro Diaz.
One more, one more. Oh, one more, one more, one more. Right. Okay, we're good, good, good. Uh, thank you, Pedro and Juana, for being superior leaders, and thank you, Pastor Mangum. We wish you the best as you move on uh, as Executive Secretary for our conference, and uh, we're going to miss Pastor Mangum in the youth programs. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Praise the Lord for our Pathfinder leaders and our Pathfinders. Amen. Amen. They, they are scattered all over the campground. Uh, I went to bed last night, and I saw tents popping up in the dark and flashlights and, and coolers being moved and everything else, and I woke up to tent city, and there were pathfinders all over the camp meeting. So I praise the Lord. And there's an announcement I, I really need you to pay attention to, especially the people on the outside of the auditorium tonight who have tables set up. After this program, the Pathfinder clubs will be coming in, and they will need your tables. So I would advise you to uh, take off your, your, uh, your displays that you have and put them to the back wall because all of those tables will be used all around the auditorium will be used by Pathfinder clubs putting their uh, honors out there and they will be judged tomorrow morning. Now after tomorrow morning is finished, then you can go ahead and set your, your display back up. But please, just know they're gonna come around and, and don't think that there's a horde of young people trying to take your tables. But that's what they're trying to do. <laughs> So that was announcement number one. Announcement number two is I talked to President uh, Dave Livermore and I said, man, those blueberries out there really are looking good. Because if you don't know it, uh, my trailer sits closest to the blueberry patch and I can smell them. And I said to him, I think I might sneak over. And he says, if you do, those are leased to someone else. They are not ours to partake of. So if you go over there, you probably will be looking for work. So I would advise you and your families, if uh, you are hungry for blueberries, after Sabbath, go to the store and buy some blueberries. Don't go pick them, because if you go out and pick them, I'm going to tell you a quick story. I don't know if they're streaming or not. I hope they're not. When I was a young boy, I went to my neighbor's, and I decided to relieve him of some strawberries. Well, he decided to load up his shotgun with rock salt. I don't need to tell you anymore, but I never went for more strawberries. <laughs> I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I'm not saying it's not. So uh, just be ready for anything, okay? We're going to continue on this morning with, or this evening with uh, uh, our treasurer, Elder Nick Henson, and he is elder as he was ordained this afternoon in a wonderful ceremony. So uh, Elder Nick, would you come forward? Good evening. Well, our ushers, please come forward. I don't know about you, but I've been incredibly blessed by the meetings that we've had, the fellowship, um, the time we've been able to spend together and, and focus on Jesus. Um, the, this, this camp meeting takes um, quite a few resources, and, and we'd like to ask you to partner with us in helping to offset some of those expenses. So we bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we've enjoyed the, the blessings and the the time together. We ask your Heavenly Father that you bless Alex and his message. Please be with us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen.
We have been blessed today with many wonderful things, new experiences from ordination to ministry to gospel feast about the second coming of Jesus. But there is always a special joy for those who've been called to ministry and be able to take their son or their daughter and baptize them into fellowship with the Seventh-day Adventist Church and into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. And so this evening we have Pastor David Sigmani who is going to be baptizing his daughter Priya this evening. So we'd like to invite you to turn your attention over to the right side of the stage where the baptistry is set up as we enjoy this beautiful experience of a father baptizing his daughter into the church. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Priya, this evening... Mom and I are so excited that you're giving or making a great decision to follow Jesus in your life. Not only us, and you have your brother that's so excited, and you have all your family and the friends, those who are here. How many of you are here to support Priya today? Can you stand up? Oh, there. You see, so many people are here, Priya. But I want to tell you something. You know, after we had stillbirth with our second child, and I was frightened to have another one. So years went by. My we only son we had was Stephen, was growing up, and he was 10 years old. One day I came home. I told my wife, you know, I want to have another child. I wanted to adopt a little girl, so that'll be great after for Stephen to enjoy with his little sister. You know, my wife said, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, uh-huh. Few months went by, she gave me a news that she's pregnant. Can you believe that? You know, instead of me getting excited, I was so concerned, frightened, some kind of fear came into my hearts and mind. You know, my friends, we prayed every day for Priya. We want to see that it shouldn't happen like it happened to Stevens or the brother when he had the stillbirth. You know, when Priya came, the day came, doctor said, we need to have a, what is that? Need to have an early, uh, Early birth, what is that called? <laughs> okay, the time came. I tell you, I was watching with fright, and I can see my whole body was shaking. But here Priya comes, both the eyes open, letting me know, Dad, why are you worried? I'm, I'm okay, Dad. I'm happy. You know, since then, there's a joy in the family. Stephen get to enjoy his sister. And I had a privilege to baptize Stephen 13 years ago. He turned out great. And he's a minister today. He's going to baptize many people, Priya. But Priya, since then, been a blessing in our family. In fact, sometimes he tells us what to do. But uh, I just wanted to let her know that today should be the last day. We'll be telling you what to do more. <laughs> That's no more, tell us. Again, Priya, can you tell people, why did you take this big decision, Priya? Yeah, Do it. It's okay. okay. Um, to make a public decision that I've decided to choose Jesus. Amen. 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 I tell you, today, more than ever, I know all the angels in heaven are more excited. And Jesus is excited this morning. Priya, just because... You want to follow Jesus all the way. I want to baptize you this evening. Name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Can you pray for us? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, once again we want to thank you for the privilege that each and every one of us we have today to follow you in our life, Heavenly Father. Today, Priya, 
decided to follow and made a great decision in her life, Lord. Continue to bless her. I know Satan always comes after us. But help her to resist the temptation and continue to follow you all the way. Continue to lead her according to your will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Congratulations, Priya. May the Lord bless you as you continue to grow in His grace and mercy. I'd like to invite you now, if you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to our scripture reading, which is found in John chapter 13, and we're going to read verse 34 and 35. I'll give you a moment to find that and to follow along. John chapter 13, looking at verse 34 and 35. Familiar words of Jesus are spoken here. And in verse 34, it says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Verse 35 reads, By this all men will know that you are my disciple, if you have love one for another. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. At this time, we are going to be blessed once again with Sister Chloe as she brings to us this evening a special music. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes? Okay, hi. Um, I'm honored to sing for you tonight and... You know, with the baptism that just happened, baptism happens when we know that we are tired of our old life and we want a new life with Jesus. And this whole week at camp meeting, we're celebrating that hope that we have in Jesus' second coming because we are tired of this life here on earth. We want our life with him in heaven. And this medley that I'm going to sing for you is a medley of songs that are of longing for heaven and of longing for Jesus. And I pray that it's a blessing. Deep river, my home is over Jordan. Deep river, Lord, I want to cross over into campground deep river my home is over Jordan deep to cross over into campground. Oh, don't you want to go to that gospel feast that promised land?
pleasure traveling through this world of woe. Yet there's no sickness, toil, or danger to that bright world to which I go. I'm going there to see my Savior. I'm going there no more to roam. I'm only going over Jordan. I'm only Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn through the storm. I just don't understand it, how they can open up their mouth and something like that comes out of it. <laughs> it's just spectacular. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Chloe. Just amazing music. Well, let me introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, Alex Bryan comes from uh, North Carolina originally, and then went to Southern, over to Andrews, and got your doctorate at? In Oregon. In Oregon. And uh, pastors at Walla Walla University Church. And it's just a delight to have him. Have you been blessed by Pastor Brian already? <laughs> Absolutely. What a, what a treasure of messages we've had. Well, we look forward to it tonight, that's for sure. Let me pray for you, Alex. Heavenly Father, I ask a special blessing on Alex as he speaks to us. Bless our ears as well as his mouth and his heart and his mind. Help us to hear the message from on high. Come close to us right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless Amen. you. Thank you, Dave. Well, in the... Brian household, there exists a continuum of shower duration. My wife, who's a native Pacific Northwesterner, is an environmentalist. She takes very short showers. I, however, believe that cleanliness is next to godliness. I like longer showers. Our son, William, who's four, is more of a tub guy at this point. But Audrey, who's now nine, but since she was very little, if she's allowed to go about her showers any which way she would like to, she will drain the tank to the very last drop. 
Several years ago, when she was just a little thing, we were traveling uh, where I was speaking in a rustic setting, and we were in a particular cabin. And I had uh, got her all set up in the bathroom, in the shower, the shower was going, and I thought everything was just right. When a couple minutes later, she starts yelling, Daddy, 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 come quick. I think, what's the matter? Daddy, 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 come quick. The water is so cold. So I go into the bathroom there and put my hand up underneath the shower head. And it's, if anything, a little on the hot side. I said, Audrey, what are you talking about? Daddy, Daddy, it's so cold. Do something. Well, then I kind of sort out what's going on. The shower head has been broken. And what's coming out is not a nice steady stream, but a mist. And between uh, the location where the water is coming out of this broken shower head, until it falls several feet below to where my daughter's head is, she's just a little thing, I mean, it's losing a lot of temperature in the process, and it is quite cold by the time it falls to where her body is. Daddy, 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 do something. And I tried to explain in like three-year-old language that this is the way it was going to be. Daddy, daddy, do something. I finally said, Audrey, what do you want me to do? She said, Daddy, pick me up, pick me up. And so I rolled up my sleeves, stuck out my arm, <laughs> and lifted my daughter that she might have a warm shower. I hope this is what we will do for one another this camp meeting week. We come into this place, we gather at this convocation, coming from a cold world. A world of sin, a world of car accidents and cancer, a world of suffering, a cold world. And we need one another, don't we? We need to lift one another up into the warm presence of our Father in heaven. This is why we come together. I pray throughout this week, as you spend time together, that you would find yourselves lifted into the warmth of the Spirit of our Heavenly Father. We say to one another uh, frequently, I think, boy, I look forward to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Do you long for that? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We talk about that a lot. But what does that mean exactly? Have you ever thought about that? Like, what does that look like, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? There's one particular vision in Paul's first letter to the Corinthian church in chapter number 12, where he describes the outpouring of the Spirit, that the Spirit pours forth gifts on the church. And the outpouring of these gifts create a sense of unity we become one body together, but also we are filled up with leadership and administration and evangelism and all kinds of gifts that are given to the church to function with vibrancy. Paul describes this scene, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We know it when the church is at one and when the church is functioning in a very real way by the power of the Spirit. But then the apostle does something I find interesting, at the very end of the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, after all of this, he says, but eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way. Interesting. Now, I'll only do this to you once. The Greek behind the phrase, the most excellent way, is Hooper Ballo. Now, we actually have a sense of what this means in English, for Hooper is where we get the word hyper, right? Hyper. And Ballo is where we get several words like ballistics and ball and balloon. It seems here that Paul is using some sports terminology track and field. He is saying, I am now, I've, I've laid all this out for you, what the power of the Holy Spirit will look like, but now I want to show you the most excellent way. Now I will give you 
hooper ballo. Now I will give you the hyper ball. I'm now going to throw the ball further down the field than I have thrown it before. I'm now going to show you the most excellent way. I'm now going to describe for you what it looks like when the Holy Spirit is poured out on the church. We're going to go further than we've ever gone before, our apostle says. I am now going to show you the most excellent way. And then he goes on to describe how we will know what it looks like when the Spirit is poured out. The 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, beginning in verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. For whether there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. And here our apostle is talking about the present age. But when completeness comes, referring now to the second coming to heaven. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. He continues with this metaphor of the present and the future. When I was a child, talking about now, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, referring now to the arrival in heaven, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection As in a mirror, but then in heaven we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Now stop there for a second. Interesting. Paul says, we know things now in part. We see them unclearly. We can't help but approach things in a childlike way. But one day, everything will be clear. One day we will be mature. One day everything will become full. And what is the context of the apostle saying these words? What's the subject? The subject is love. Paul is saying to us, it doesn't matter how hard we try in the present moment. We cannot grasp just how important the subject of love is to God. One day we will arrive in heaven and our jaws will drop and hit the floor. God, being a loving person, was that important to you? We will see clearly. We will be blown away, Paul says. And then he finishes this magisterial chapter with these memorable words words. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Think about that for a second. Faith and hope, the essence of belief in God himself, important. But Paul says, not Alex, but Paul says, love is even more important. It is even a greater gift than belief itself. Extraordinary. Our apostle says, you want to know what it looks like for the Holy Spirit to be poured out on the church. Let me show you the most excellent way. Let me describe for you what this would mean. It means that we become a church 
dedicated to love. That we care for one another in this way. Let me share a couple stories with you tonight about how I've seen this play out. The power of love. In Academy, I had a job working at a nursing care facility. I was 16 years old and had just received my driver's license. Do you remember what it felt like when you just got your driver's license? It is one of the greatest feelings known to mankind, the, that moment. The incredible sense of freedom, the capacity to explore the world. And the job I had at the nursing home care facility was in the maintenance and grounds department, and we did many things. Weed eaters and lawn mowers, and we would fix beds and toilets and wheelchairs. There were many jobs in our portfolios. But there was one particular job that we liked better than all of the others. You see, we had a company truck. And when we were given the responsibility, the task of driving that truck, that was better than anything. And on one particular day, my supervisor came to me and said, Alex, I need you to take the company truck and drive to a local mill to pick up some wood which we would burn in our real wood burning fireplace in the cafeteria. And so I merrily took the keys, jumped in the truck, and made my way out to pick up this wood. But apparently I was daydreaming. For I realized after a while that I had missed several turns. I was way off course. I don't know if I was thinking about girls or if I was thinking about the glories of having a driver's license or what was going on but I was far off course and it became clear to me that if I did not get back on course quickly I could get in some real trouble. I noticed in front of me uh, not too far there was a circular gravel driveway off to the left in front of a house, a residence. And so I quickly made a U-turn and I mean quickly and in the process of turning that truck around, I sprayed a rooster tail of gravel up onto a front lawn, nearly wiping out a dog. But I did get back on track, went to the mill, picked up the wood, brought it back to the nursing home care facility, and I was outside neatly stacking the wood, very happy with the job I had been given. Well, a couple moments into this uh, activity of unloading the wood, over the loudspeaker, a voice. Alex Bryan, would you please report to the administrator's office? Now, this was not an unusual request for one of us who worked in maintenance and grounds. From time to time, the CEO of the company would ask us to perform a particular task. I, again, merrily made my way to his suite, and his secretary invited me to go into his office. He then said something to me that he had never said before. He said, Alex, would you sit down? This was not a job I had been given before to sit down in his office, but sat, sit down I did. Alex, he said, um, we just got a phone call from a resident of our city who says that a truck with the name and phone number of our institution on the side of it has just gone flying through his driveway, sprayed gravel over his front yard and nearly killed his dog. Can you tell me about this? I had a bit of a problem in that we only had one vehicle, so I couldn't, you know, narrow it down. It was, I mean, it, there it was. Um, I explained to him as honestly and fairly as I could what had happened, and he just listened. He said, thanks, that will be all. You can go out and finish stacking the wood. I wasn't so merry at that point. Stacking that wood, my heart was heavy. I knew what he was up to. A phone call to the principal, a phone call to my parents. My license surely would be suspended. I would never drive the truck again. My life as a 16-year-old was over. I was convinced. About five minutes later, over the loudspeaker, Alex Bryan, will you please report to the administrator's office? And so I did my walk, that lonely walk. Into the suite, his secretary invited me uh, to go in. I looked at the administrator in the eye, and he said something to me that he had never said before. One word, 
catch. I put my hands up because the next thing I knew, he was throwing a ring of keys at me. His keys. He said, Alex, my car, and you have to understand, his car is the kind of sedan a CEO should be driving. A special parking place, no one went near this car ever. My car, he says, needs some work done across town, and I'm wondering if you would drive it and get that taken care of for me. I mean, I'm looking for the trap door. I'm want, you know, looking for the, you know, what's the catch? What am I supposed to say? He said, you may go now. I walked out to that parking lot, opened the door of that beautiful vehicle, got in, and let me tell you, all the way across town, 10 and 2 and like 30 miles an hour, <laughs> all the way there, got the maintenance taken care of, all the way back, gave him back the keys. He never said a word to my parents, never said a word to the principal, Nothing. Now, do you want to know the power of love? Do you want to know the power of grace? How do you think I worked for that man for the next four years? Hard. You see, we want our young people, if I might digress for a second, we wish for our young people to work hard for the kingdom, to be productive for Jesus Christ. The power of grace, the power of a culture of love is needed in order to inspire them to be serious about the things that really count. I had a similar experience in college. I was going home one particular weekend. This is when I was at Southern. We had got together a group of guys and girls to um, head to Asheville, uh, my hometown, uh, for the weekend. And uh, we had figured things out. My parents were going to be out of town. But my uh, Aunt Bonnie, uh, she lived about a half a mile away. She was going to be out of town as well. But all the girls were going to stay at her house. And all the guys were going to stay uh, with me at my parents' house. And my grandmother lived across the street. So got into town. Um, everybody was there. I went across the street to talk to my grandparents. Now, you have to understand that my grandmother... Everything is done to a T, okay? I mean, she did everything with excellence. The lines of her vacuum cleaner were straight and perfect on the carpet. It was always a three-course meal. She insisted on only the best conversation. Did you know that she only wore a dress, never a pair of pants, her entire life? She had work dresses and she had regular dresses. That's what she, she never drove a car. She assumed that that was my grandfather's responsibility. Which worked out pretty well until later in life he was reading a magazine about how driving the same speed all the time saved fuel mileage uh, and such. And uh, so, true story, it was like on the interstate, 40 miles an hour. <laughs> Through a school zone, 40 miles an hour. Boom, I mean... Um, but she was just one of these people. If it was spiritual, if it was true, if it was lovely, everything was like that. She was a dedicated Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Believe it or not, died on Sabbath, October 22, in her bed studying her Sabbath school lesson. I mean, just an extraordinary figure in my life. So I made my way across the street to, to uh, let her know that we were in town. We talked about uh, several things, and then she popped the question. Alex, she said, are all the girls settled in over at your aunt's house and are all the boys settled in at your parents' house across the street? Now, I failed to mention that um, as these plans had developed, it, as it turned out, only one girl made the trip and there was a whole group of guys. And the one girl, she did not feel comfortable staying in a house that she wasn't familiar with. And so we made the decision that we would all just stay at the same house. And so my grandmother asked the question with intent, are the girls over there and the boys over there, is everything settled out the way it should be? And I said to her, yes, Grandma, that's right. All the girls are over there and all the boys are over here. Talked for a couple more moments, made my way back across the street, 
And I got a feeling wash over me that I had never had before. The kind of feeling that little boys who lie to their grandmothers should have. My brothers and sisters, I do not believe in ever burning hell. But if I did, I'm pretty sure that little boys who lie to their grandmothers will burn long and hot. Oh, I could not stand the feeling, the sense of guilt that I had lied to her. So a couple minutes later, I, I got the courage and I walked back across that street, up the hill, knocked on the door. My grandmother answered, Alex, what is it? I said, Grandma, I need to tell you something. She said, well, come in. And she, she shuttled me to the other side of the room, away from where my grandfather was sitting. And she said, what is it? She leaned in close. And I said, well, Grandma, I didn't, I didn't tell you the truth. And I explained what had happened. What she did next, I will never forget. She leaned into me and in a whisper said, that's okay, Alex. It'll be our little secret. Now, I know she didn't agree with the decision that had been made. But did you hear what she said? Notice she did not say, Alex, I will keep your little secret. Oh, no. She became complicit in the crime. This will be our little secret. How honest do you think I attempted to live my life after that experience? How often do you think I thought about the strength of my grandmother's character and what she expected of me after that experience? You see, the power of love, the power of forgiveness, the power of grace to produce great things in human beings what does the outpouring of the Holy Spirit look like? The Apostle Paul says a rich climate of love in the church and in our families and in the places that we live and watch what can happen when we function in this way. I think this has to do with trust. I have a picture uh, that I brought here. Um, our children have taken swimming lessons at the pool at uh, Walla Walla University. And here's a picture of William a couple years ago. You know, they learned many things, right? Putting their head underwater, how to float, how not to swallow all the water, uh, <laughs> how to obey the rules of the pool, backstroke, front stroke, you know, the, the whole work. But, but the critical moment, let me tell you, in case you don't know, the critical moment is this. When they learn to jump off the diving board, now, I ask you tonight, what is going through my son's mind in this moment? What is he asking his little self? One question. One question. Can I trust my teacher? That's what's going through his head right now. Can I trust my teacher? And what is his teacher trying to convince him of, that she can be trusted, that she has his best interest at heart, if you will, that she loves him, that she cares for him. You see, if we wish our children, if we wish for the next generation to take great leaps for God, if we wish them to be bold, if we wish for them to be holy, if we wish for them to be committed to the things that we would like them to be committed to, I submit to you, they are asking the question, is my mom, is my dad, are my teachers, what about my pastors, what about my church, can I trust them? Can I trust them? Do they love me? This is the critical question. I'd like to finish uh, with a story about a kind of radical love that I learned from my daughter. It was the Christmas of the year 2009. I was in the living room setting up the nativity scene, placing each 
figurine, Mary, Joseph, the angels, the animals, baby Jesus, the manger, each in a particular place. When my daughter came in, again, just a little thing at the time, and she asked me a question. She said, Daddy, where's King Herod? Where's Herod? Tried to explain to her that King Herod was, in fact, not in the nativity scene. She was having none of it. She said, but isn't King Herod in the Christmas story? I said, yes, but he's not in the nativity scene. And she said, well, if he's in the Christmas story, he ought to be in the nativity. I said, well, he doesn't want to be in the nativity. (laughs) Well, why not? I said, well, he's not very nice. He didn't want to be there. Well, she just could not abide this fact. She runs out of the room back to where her bedrooms are. And re-emerges a couple minutes later with a doll overhead like this. Daddy, daddy, look, she says, look, daddy, it's King Herod. And he told me he's ready to play nicely now. (laughs) And in the year of our Lord, 2009... In the living room of the Bryans of Walla Walla, Washington, USA, the nativity community of Jesus Christ included one King Herod. Out of the mouth of babes, a desire of forgiveness, of love, of compassion, a desire for every human heart. My brothers and sisters, I want the Holy Spirit to be poured out on the church. And if I take our Apostle Paul seriously in these inspired writings, I must come to the conclusion that love, love is the mark of that outpouring. A love that then gives birth to rich holiness and obedience and commitment to the great cause of Christianity and to the movement of people who proclaim the soon coming of Jesus Christ. Oh yes, even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, Alex, we want to thank you so much for giving up of your time, your busy schedule. Please tell your wife and children thank you for us, for lending you to us for a weekend. You've been a tremendous blessing to us that uh, we'll carry for a long time in our heart. We've got a small token of our appreciation. There's a few, um, I can't even remember if it's pecans. Pecans. I think it said one way in the northwest and one way down here. Yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah, be careful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but they're, um, they bear the name of the, of the people that gave us this land oh, to build this cult, uh, academy on. And also I've got a, a shirt in there for you. Thank you. And uh, wear that probably in Upper Columbia, but don't tell me you got it from me, okay? <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. As a prelude to our closing prayer, turn with me to page 28. Come Holy Spirit, I'd like to just sing the refrain. The first time we'll sing it through with the accompaniment, and the second time I'd like to sing it just a cappella. Come Holy Spirit, I need you. sweet spirit I pray come in your strength and your power come in your own gentle way 
To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Look, he is coming in the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. 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 